Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. It's such a blessing to be here with all of you. And this afternoon, as we go back uh, into God's Word, this time John chapter 12, as we begin, I want to tell you that we will not be talking about any Marvel movies today. Maybe next time. But definitely, we are still very much in our Jesus Unboxed series, knowing Jesus through the Gospel of John. And that is precisely the purpose of the Gospel of John and of the, the Bible itself, so that you and I may come to know not about Jesus, but come to know Him in a personal, real, life-transforming way. But just, as, just before we get into the Scripture itself, I said we will not talk about any Marvel movies this afternoon. But you see, aside from movies, another thing I enjoy are documentaries. I don't know about you, but documentaries are fascinating because they deal with real situations, real events, real people, and what happened to them at certain points in their lives. Now you might be saying, what does this guy do all week? Marvel movies, documentaries, oh well, you know. I only watch these things in Tagalog sa mga nakaw na sandali, okay? But this is really wonderful. Let me share with you one documentary that I've had the privilege of viewing in the last couple of weeks. That documentary is called Coast Guard Alaska, obviously part of the U.S. Coast Guard. Now, what amazes me about this team of men and women is the lengths they go to to fulfill their mission in life. You see, their mission, their motto is very simple. It is so that others may live. That's their motto. And their purpose, their mission, their passion is to save people who cannot save themselves. These men and women, at a moment's notice, they have to be ready to fly or somehow take themselves to an area, a place where people are in danger. In danger, for example, like a boat capsizing, people in danger of drowning, a danger of hypothermia, and oftentimes they have to uh, do these rescues in the worst weather conditions. And Alaska is known, of course, for very uh, unfriendly weather. Now, amazingly, there are men and women constantly who raise their hands and say, I want to join Coast Guard, uh, in general, Coast Guard Alaska to be specific. And these men and women, you know, they, they really uh, give credence to the biblical principle, many are called, but few are chosen, because it's difficult. You see, they say, I want to be a rescue swimmer in Coast Guard Alaska. And these men and women who actually train to be rescue swimmers, they go through intense training. I mean, it is such a difficult training period. One of the uh, training master chiefs, uh, as they call them, he said this on the, on the documentary interview. He said, I train these people up to the point where I myself can entrust my life to them, or I can entrust the life of my children or my family to them. That's the only time they can really pass the training and become a rescue swimmer. Because folks, these people, do what nobody else does. I mean, they do things like this, to be lowered into very, or jump, or be lowered into very precarious situations to save people who cannot save themselves. Why in the world are we talking about Coast Guard Alaska this afternoon? Because once again, you and I can learn a very important spiritual principle from this documentary. And that spiritual principle is, we all need to be saved. We all need to be rescued because you and I are people who cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. We all need to be saved spiritually. And as I think about the imagery of these Coast Guard rescues, it reminded me of a, of a hymn, a worship song that was written in 1912. No, I was not yet around in 1912, okay? 
But let me just show you a part of that hymn because the imagery is so amazingly familiar with the story uh, that we told earlier. The title of the hymn is Love Lifted Me. Now, does anybody know this song? Anyone in this audience? Are you scratching your ear or do you know this song? Because I'm going to give you a microphone so you can sing it for us. No, no. Love Lifted Me, this is, these are the lyrics. Look at the imagery. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within and sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, who is that? That's Jesus. The master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Isn't that a wonderful song? Then the chorus goes, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Sige na, kantahin na natin. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Oh, you see, you know it pala eh. Praise God. What an amazing imagery of Jesus, the ultimate rescuer, pulling us out of the angry waves of the condemnation of sin. Jesus came to save. That's our message today. Glorify Him. Jesus, the King, as we will see in John chapter 12, hailed and heralded by the people as King. Now, was it the right king that they had in mind? We will see later on. But Jesus the King, Jesus the Lord of Lords, He came for a single purpose, and that is to save people who could not save themselves. And our response to this amazing Savior King is to glorify Him. To glorify means to honor. But you see, you and I can honor people we honor God too. That's part of our mission statement. But glorify is a different word. It's as if to say, this honor belongs only to the one true God. And so Jesus, who came to save, our life's response is to honor Him. Now, this whole idea of we being unable to save ourselves, needing a rescuer, needing a savior, is that just popular Christian tradition or is that in the Bible? Very clearly in the Bible it says in Romans chapter 5 verse 6, for while we were still helpless. What does the word helpless mean? Even in the original language it means too sick or too weak to help oneself. Helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Obviously, there is a relationship between these two words. It's talking about the same people. We, you and me, we were helpless, we were ungodly, and that's why Christ died for us. What does ungodly mean? You may be sitting here this afternoon and you're saying, uh, excuse me, I never thought of myself as ungodly. Okay. Let me give you a, a synonym to the word ungodly. The word is wicked. Do you like that better? And you're saying, no, wicked is like, I woke up this morning to kill innocent children. <laughs> no, that's not what wicked means. Wicked means God is not at the center of your life. Wicked means your life is about you, your priorities, your plans, your pleasure, your pursuits. When God is not at the center of your life, my life, we are ungodly. We are wicked. It is as simple as that. And then in the parallel verse, in verse 8, it becomes even clearer. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were, same phrase, while we were helpless, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's exactly the same idea. You can take the same phrase and you can substitute helpless with sinner and sinners with helpless because that's the whole idea. We cannot save ourselves. 
our life's anthem, our life song is gusto kong bumait. Pero hindi ko Oh, kunyari hindi niyo pa alam 'yun, ha? Gusto kong bumait pero hindi ko magawa. In English, I want to be good, but I no can do. Because we are helpless to save ourselves. Again, the message for this afternoon, Jesus came to save, glorify him. Our message will have two parts. The first part is we will talk about how focused Jesus was on his mission to come and to give his life to save us. And in the end part of the message, we will talk about how to glorify him as our life's response. Okay? So we'll now go into John chapter 12 and we'll talk about how Jesus came to save. Now I know we know this in our head. Yeah, I know that even from my boyhood, my young days, Jesus came to save. Let's look at what the Bible has to say, specifically in John chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now you and I, last week, we were witness to an amazing miracle when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know, the world was never the same again. And we pick up from that story, John chapter 11, and we are now again with the same characters, Lazarus, later on we'll see Mary and Martha. But here, just to position where we are, it says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, which is about two miles out from Jerusalem. Now, the reason why I highlighted the word Passover is because since we're talking about the imagery of a rescue mission, Passover was like what they would call in the military the LZ, the landing zone. That was Jesus' landing zone. From eternity past, it was the plan of God Almighty that his son Jesus would be sacrificed on the Passover. And so we are told exactly that at this point when Jesus came to Bethany, the countdown was on. It was six days before the landing zone. Why is that significant? If you look at another gospel, same the gospel of Matthew, and you go forward a bit in the countdown, it says in Matthew 26, when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, so kanina six days, now two days, after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. So he's saying to his disciples, you know very well that we are approaching an immovable object, if you will. The Passover is going to happen in two days. There is no postponing that, and that is my landing zone. Because exactly on the Passover, I am telling you, the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Not a day later, not a day before, but on the Passover itself. Even if you look at further uh, in that chapter, then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. They plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Now, folks, you and I know that this had been the desire of the Jewish leaders for quite some time. And theoretically, they had many opportunities to do so, to arrest Jesus, to harm him, to silence him, and to kill him. But it never happened. Why? Because Jesus himself explained it. He said, my time had not yet come. But now his time was coming up very soon. But still, it wouldn't be an, an, a day earlier or a day later. He said, look, but they were saying not during the festival, the feast that was coming up. No way, they were saying not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. You see, the fact that Jesus' sacrifice and the Passover perfectly coincided is not just human orchestration. You know, people, Jesus could not tell people, oh, hurry up, hurry up, crucify me, Passover. No, this was planned from the very beginning. How do we know? 
For those of us who were together in our Exodus series, which was an amazing series, just like all the others, if you remember Exodus chapter 12, the background here is the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, and they have been aching and longing for their Redeemer to set them free from the bonds of slavery. And finally, after the first nine plagues, God tells them through Moses, now the appointed time has come. This is your going, going to be your last night in Egypt. And I want you, each family, to take a lamb, an unblemished lamb, and I want you to slay this lamb. And then the instructions continue. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts, left and right, and on the lintel of the houses, the top, when in which they eat it. Now, the imagery here is amazing because if you follow what they did, putting the blood on the lintel, on the two doorposts left and right, if you look at the imagery it creates, top to bottom, left and right, is the image of the cross. And that is only one sign way back in the Old Testament that the sacrifice of Jesus was the plan for you and for me from eternity past. And furthermore, God said to his people, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. That's where it comes from. I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The angel of death, the presence of God, would not pass over them because they were nice people, because they were obedient people, because they were not. They were a complaining people, as you saw in the rest of the uh, Old Testament story. But God said, on the basis of the blood, the plague will not come upon you. And in the same manner, you and I, we deserve death separation from God for all eternity because of our sin. But when we come into faith in Jesus, when we give our lives to Him, when we receive Him as Lord and Savior, we become washed in His blood. And when the Father looks at you and looks at me, He sees a person who has been cleansed by the precious, stainless blood of His Son. And he sees the righteousness of Jesus imputed in you and in me. And that's why the Bible says there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it has been the plan from the very beginning. And when we go back to the story, it becomes even more evident. Now, verse 2, so they made him a supper there. And Martha, again, we met her last week. Martha was serving, Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him, and Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, it is said that this is also known as Spike nard, that's another name, specific name given to it. And it is said to come from the mountains of India. So, you know, if, if you like Indiana Jones movies, you know, it's something like that. It comes from a faraway place. It's so hard to get. It is so expensive. It is so rare. As a matter of fact, sometimes when people bought spike nard, it was not for the sake of smelling good. It was as an investment in the same way that people would buy gold as part of their financial investment. It was so expensive. As a matter of fact, when we read in the next passage, the, esti the minimum estimate would be 300 denarii. Some, perhaps based on the Gospel of Luke, estimate it may be 500 denarii. Now, a denarius is one day's wage. So 300 to 500 denarii would mean one or two years' worth of wages saved and invested in one pound of this pure nard. Now, I don't know about you, but you do the math. How much of your income every year do you save? 
How many years will it take you to save one year's worth of your income? It will take a long time. That's why some sources say this was probably Mary's life savings that she spent or invested in this nard and with which she anointed the feet of Jesus. Now, we'll go back to this later and see what more we can learn. In the meantime, Judas, Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Now, my friends, what can you say about Judas? I know what you're thinking. Who does talaga? Huh? Can you imagine that? Wow. I mean, saying these things and then secretly he, he would steal from their money box. Wow. But wait. Maybe there's something we can learn from him. There's a reason why God put this part in this gospel. Is it possible that even to a small extent, sometimes that you and I could be like Judas? Huh? What do you mean? Wait. Are there times when we do not walk our talk? Don't answer. Just between you and yourself and you and God. Are there times when we do not walk our talk? You see, that was the problem of Judas. He said one thing, he did something else. Is it also possible that we say nice words like Judas or we do nice things, righteous looking things on the, you know, on the external, but we actually have a secret sin that we don't want people to know about? By the way, did Jesus know what Judas was doing? Of course. There is no hiding. You see this whole thing about secret sin? It's ridiculous. It may be a secret to people, but never a secret to God. Another question. Could it be that just like Judas, there are times that we complain and we criticize, but at the end of the day, it's actually a smoke screen because there's something about our lives which, if it were to be made known, it would be so shameful and so embarrassing. So, my friend, let's not be so quick to call Judas who does, because maybe there are times that we reflect even a little bit of his character. Now, why am I saying this? I'm just saying this because the Bible says our heart is deceitful above all. And that's why we cannot save ourselves. That's why we need Jesus to save us and to change us. Amen? So let's see. Let's go on. Therefore, Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. First, let me comment on verse 8. Jesus is not anti-poor. I think you and I understand that very well. He was just stating a matter of fact. He was saying, this lady, Mary, let her alone. She's just making the most of the opportunity because my, the length of my earthly life is only a matter of hours. The poor, on the other hand, will always be here. And besides, he knew Judas was not really concerned about the poor to begin with. Now, apparently, this spike nard, because it was so expensive, it was often used to anoint kings. But at the same time, it may have been used on some occasions to anoint dead bodies for burial. But I have a feeling that burial was never on Mary's mind. It was simply to honor Jesus. And yet, in the mind of Jesus, because he was so focused on his mission, what did he say? He said, let her alone so she may keep it for the day of my burial. Because that was singularly in the mind of Jesus. This is my mission and I am going to fulfill that mission. So now the countdown continues. 
Verse 12, on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees, went out to meet him, and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were in that crowd and I heard what Jesus did for Lazarus, I would say, this is the guy. This is the guy we need to liberate us from Roman domination. Now, before we go any further, this whole idea of the large crowd. How large is a large crowd? You know, sometimes when we see it in some movies, it's like 50 people, you know, maybe they have a budget constraint, okay? But how large was this crowd? Okay, there was actually one census that was discovered of an actual Passover feast where they had 256,000 lambs that were sacrificed. What's the significance? Apparently, the ratio of people to sacrificial lambs is at least 10 people to one lamb. So, if that ratio is to be followed, and you have 256,000 lambs, then you have something like 2.7, maybe close to 3 million people. That is a lot of people. Even by today's standards in Metro Manila, where we don't even know how many people live here, 3 million people is still a very large crowd. Now, the amazing thing is here you have the people picking up the branches of palm trees and welcoming Jesus and celebrating his arrival. And this was normally done, this waving of the branches and putting on the ground and laying their clothes on the ground, which you find in another gospel. This is normally done when you welcome royalty, you welcome a king. And it's amazing because in the past, when I say in the past, in previous chapters, people wanted to make Jesus king. If you remember the episode of the loaves and the fish, it said that they wanted to make Jesus king by force. And again, it never happened. He never subjected himself. He never presented himself as that. But now he did. Now he was there accepting the praise and the welcome of the people. Do you realize that in this specific time, this was also the time when the lambs were presented for inspection to see if they were really qualified, unblemished lambs for the sacrifice. And at that very same time, you have Jesus presenting himself to the people as if to say, here is God's unblemished lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, the timing is impeccable. Why? because it was the plan from the very beginning, and Jesus was going to fulfill it. Now, this crying out of Hosanna, what does that mean? Psalm 113 to 118 is called the Hallel. It is the psalms that are sung or recited during the Passover celebration. Now, part of it here, Psalm 118, it says, O Lord, do save. The meaning of the word Hosanna is save save now or do save and the rest of the verse says we beseech you O Lord we beseech you do send prosperity blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord we have blessed you from the house of the Lord you can sense the urgency behind uh, this this prayer this psalm it says we beseech you we beseech you beseeching is not just a normal request it's almost like begging there's a deep sense of of desperation and urgency and fast forward back to the time when Jesus was being uh, presented. You know, the people were desperate for a king, for a Messiah. But here's the question. What Messiah king did they have in mind? You see, these people wanted someone who will rescue them from Roman domination, not necessarily from their sin. And so when it became clear later on that Jesus was not the Messiah they had in mind, Many of these people who first cried Hosanna would then cry, crucify him. What can we learn from this truth? Again, a reason why we need to be saved because we cannot save ourselves. Sometimes people have an idea of who Jesus is, our own concoction of who Jesus should be to us. You see, many times we look at Jesus as an ATM. 
just to provide for our needs, or a painkiller to soothe the hurt, or a genie to just grant us our three wishes. Is that what we think of Jesus? A problem solver to smoothen our life? And when he doesn't come through, we turn our backs on him and say, maybe he isn't real in the first place. Let's go back to the story. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. What does this mean? First of all, Jesus finding a donkey. This is not like uh, a chance finding. It's not like, you know, Jesus was walking and people were waving these things and Jesus came and, oh, look, wait, 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 a donkey, how convenient. No, that, that wasn't the way it happened. If you read the account in the other Gospels, in Gospel of Mark, this was something planned from the beginning. Jesus told his disciples, go and find this donkey. It's tied right there. Get it for me. And if the guy asks you, why are you getting the donkey? He says, the master has need of it. And we will even return it after. You know, Jesus is so polite. He's so proper. He even said, make sure you return the donkey afterwards. But that's another story, okay? So it is not like a chamba thing, that a donkey happened to be there. This was all part of the plan. That donkey, it says, now there's a reference to the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, where it says, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. A donkey's colt, or the foal of a donkey, if you look it up in Zechariah 9.9, 9, is a young donkey, perhaps less than one year old. Specifically, a donkey that had not ever been ridden on by anyone else. And again, it's because that donkey was set apart for this time in the same way that Jesus himself was set apart for this purpose. And it says that during that time, his disciples didn't understand. But later on, when Jesus was glorified, by the way, that means he finished his mission. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. Only after that time did they remember that these things were written of him. Now, you and I don't have the time to go into all of these prophecies, but you look at Zechariah chapter 9, you look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, where it predicts even the time from the moment the decree was issued to rebuild Jerusalem in 445 B.C., up to the time the Messiah King was revealed. It was already prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. I mean, it is so amazing. This plan was there from the very, very start. Now, this thing about the donkey. Normally, a military victor would ride into a parade like this on a chariot or on a horse. But Jesus rode on a donkey. A donkey is a humble animal. And so Jesus as if illustrating his character, is riding on a humble animal, he himself, the epitome of humility. When a king rides on a donkey, it means he's coming not in war, but in peace. And Jesus came to give peace to our hearts who are so ravaged by sin and so fearful of its consequences. Let's continue. Skip over a few verses here. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Again, what does that mean? On the Passover, to be handed over, to be crucified, fulfill his mission. Then he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus was using an amazingly appropriate metaphor to describe his mission on earth. He's basically saying a grain of wheat or a seed is set apart for a purpose. Its purpose is to die because only in death and being buried under the ground will it be able to bear fruit and be the blessing that it was set apart to be. Pastor Irwin shared this illustration with me a few days ago, and that illustration is about this amazing plant, 
This is called the Judean date palm. You see, in the 1960s, some scientists, some explorers, they discovered a handful of seeds while they were in the area of Masada in Israel. And when they studied the seeds, they discovered two things. Number one, the seeds were 2,000 years old. 2,000 year old seeds. The second thing is they realized they were seeds of the Judean date palm, a species of plant which had not been seen in Israel for over a thousand years. So they kept these 2,000 year old seeds, and just some years ago, seven or so years ago, someone decided to take one of the seeds. How old is the seed? 2,000 years old. And they planted it in the ground. And lo and behold, the Judean date palm. Amazing. Why did it happen? Because the seed has been created or set apart for that purpose, to be in the ground, to die, and to bear fruit. It's the only way it will fulfill its purpose. By the way, do you know the name of this plant, the name that they gave it? Methuselah, named after the oldest person who ever lived. You go back to Genesis and you read about him over there. So, amazingly, it describes Jesus' mission. Now, Jesus said, verse 27, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You and I need to be careful how we read this statement of Jesus. He says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. In other words, if you were to translate in Tagalog, ano, ngayon pa ba ako atras? That's what he's saying. No way. He said, it is for this purpose I have come to this hour. And then he just makes it very clear. He talks to his father and he says, Father, glorify your name. And amazingly, the father answers. And he says, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Just like when Jesus was baptized and just like when Jesus was transfigured, the father responded, basically saying, Son and everybody around you, I want you to know he is doing exactly what he came to do. Jesus came to save, to give his life as a ransom for many. Then Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the, from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Crucifixion, as most of us know, has and probably still is the most shameful, painful, and brutal manner by which anyone can be killed. About 12 or 13 years ago, my wife and I were blessed with a trip to the Holy Land. And among many things that we saw was a place where they kind of depicted how the crucifixion could have most likely happened. Now, I know there are many, you know, theories or how the cross was and all that, but this one meant so much to me, and I'll explain to you why. They explained it that most likely, based on their records, their research, is that the vertical stake was already in the ground. In other words, the Romans already had these vertical stakes prepared for crucifixion, and the stakes were about, about seven feet tall. And so the condemned criminal would be carrying the horizontal beam on his shoulders. And when he came to that place where the vertical stake was, the horizontal thing would either be mounted on top of or be inserted into the vertical stake. What amazed me the most about this, I don't want to say theory, but, but this uh, thought of how crucifixion was actually done was it wasn't like the person was lifted up so high into the air. Because if it was only seven feet tall, and if I wanted to approach somebody who was crucified, and if I wanted to spit on him, 
And if I wanted to slap his face, and if I wanted to laugh at him, and if I wanted to insult him, if I wanted to hit him, if I wanted to make fun of him, I could really do it this close to his face. And that's why I never forgot that image, that thought, because it gave even deeper meaning to the shame and the pain that our Lord Jesus suffered because he came to save. But the question is, why did it have to happen that way? Why was it so intricately and infinitely planned? Let me share with you a principle. The seriousness of a problem is gauged by two things. The ultimate consequence if it is not solved and the extent of the solution required. Example, you've had these headaches. You go to the doctor, he has you tested. He seats you in front of him and he says to you, you just lack sleep. Just sleep it off. Your headache will be gone. If not, you take paracetamol and you'll be fine. So you know it's not a big deal. However, if in the same situation the, the doctor seats you next to him and he says to you, you need surgery and you needed it yesterday and if you don't get it, you will surely die. So the consequence of the problem, if not solved, is very clearly seen. And the extent of the solution requiring radical surgery also tells you how serious a problem it is. Now, where do we see this in the Bible? This principle, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Wages are things that you and I deserve to receive in exchange for something we've done. That is the definition of the word wage. Here it says what we should get or receive in exchange for our sin. Something we deserve is death, which is eternity separated from the presence of God. In other words, spending hell in eternity or eternity in hell. The solution required is not for us to just be nicer people as a result of a New Year's resolution. The only acceptable solution to our problem is Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is only through His sacrifice that eternal life is offered as a free gift of God. Why is it a free gift? Because the price has already been fully paid. The blood and the life of Jesus are the only acceptable currency to purchase salvation for you and for me. Many people are blind to that truth, but by the grace of God, He opens their eyes, just like He opened yours, just like He opened mine, and just like He opened the eyes of our dear sister who'd like to share her story with us today. Will you please welcome our sister, Nika Pablo. Nika, will you come and share, please? Good afternoon. My name is Nika Pablo. Early in life, I developed a spirit of rebellion and hatred towards men, especially my father. For most people, their fathers were their greatest superheroes, but not for me. I never felt loved by my father at that time. I only knew him as the father who constantly saw my faults not once did he compliment me for anything, and worst, he abused me when I was a child. Aside from my dad, a family friend also took advantage of me once, increasing my feelings of self-disgust. I was not able to share this with my mom because she feared my dad. Hence, I grew bitter towards her for not being able to protect me. Aside from resenting my family, I was angry with God for allowing me to suffer the way I did. I was proud and would not allow anyone to harm me. I thought that if I became somebody, I would be able to put the past behind 
escape my terrible family, and finally live a happy life. So I put all my effort in achieving good grades and making many friends, thinking that this would satisfy my life. I had different relationships with men, but I didn't fully trust and love them. One day, I met a girl whom I thought God reserved for me to make up for all the love and protection I didn't experience in the past. Our homosexual relationship began in 2001, and I thought everything would go well as long as we kept it a secret. We even decided to migrate abroad to get away from the people who wouldn't understand our love. After five years, I graduated, got a job, and we lived together in Manila. I thought this was the life I wanted. Buy the things I want, go to places I want, and be with the person I want. But for some reason, I was never at peace, and there was an emptiness inside my heart that I could not figure out. It was in May 2007 when I first joined a Bible study group in the office, and I started to feel God intervening and revealing himself to me. I was eventually invited to attend CCF Sunday services, and many times I felt convicted with the messages. I couldn't understand, but I found myself attending almost every Sunday. Through the messages, God made me realize the meaning of true love and freedom. My sins grew heavy in my heart, and I learned that I had the wrong perspective of God's design for me. And so, on June 2012, I surrendered my life to God and made Him the Savior and Lord of my life. I finally said goodbye to my girlfriend of 10 years. This breakup helped me experience God more and the things He could do to turn my life around. He continued to guide me and protect me from going back to my old life. I had a change of perspective and priorities, so I used my time to grow spiritually by joining AD Group, participating in various singles retreats, and pursuing intimacy with the Lord by having my prayer time and reading my Bible every day. I also found my desire to serve the Lord, and I was privileged when God sent me back to my hometown in Bulacan to serve in Elevate Malolos. I was afraid at first because I didn't really know how to connect with the youth, but God carried me through this journey. I met godly friends and later established my own D-group. Sharing my newfound faith to my family was not easy. It took me a while before I could finally be at ease with my siblings in talking about God. By His loving grace, my brothers and sisters accepted the Lord Jesus and the three of them got baptized. But my biggest burden were my parents because I find it really hard to reach out to them. I wanted to obey God, but I did not know how. God opened my eyes in His Word in Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, which says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. God made me see the bitterness I still had in my heart towards my parents, and that I need to forgive them. It was difficult. I did not think I could forgive. But looking back at Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, made me do what I thought was impossible. I sent a letter to my dad who was working overseas. I told him all my heartaches, but ended it by saying, Ty, because I love you and because of Jesus, I completely forgive you. As for my mom, I continued to reach out to her in many ways. I would often take her out for coffee and share the gospel through our one-by-one booklet. During our dates, I shared my heartaches, God's promises, and my experiences with the Lord. This made us grow closer until I was able to tell her that I had forgiven her as well, 
and she said sorry too. It was one of the greatest moments in my life when I felt an indescribable peace in my heart. During my first months in ministry in 2014, a friend encouraged me to join the Glorious Hope program. As a result of the program, I committed to live my life pure and holy in the eyes of God, to flee immediately from the worldly temptations and stop living a defeated life. For I am already victorious in Jesus. As John Piper said, do not be a comfort-seeking, entertainment-addicted, approval-desiring Christian. Now that I am back in Malolos, I pray that my learnings will be passed down to the next generation. I continue to serve as a small group leader and coordinator for retreats and leadership events as part of Elevate Malolos Discipleship Management Team. I share my testimony and speak to the youth on topics about homosexuality with the hope of having their lives transformed the way Jesus did to me. I am a woman who once lived under sin's bondage, but because of Jesus came and saved me, I will live to glorify Him. To Him be all the honor and praise. Praise God indeed. Brothers, sisters, will you stand and join me in praying for Nika? But just before we do that, I'd like you to meet uh, Leo Robles, the daughter of our Pastor Eddie from Malolos. See, Doctora Leo is the small group leader of this group, of which Nika is a part. Now, she's Doctora Leo because she's a dentist, one of the best dentists in the world according to her parents. <laughs> I'm sure they have a point, okay? So this is their small group. Of course, Nika has her own small group, but since they're students based in Malolos, they couldn't join us today, but let's just pray. Let's pray for this young lady, these young ladies. Lord Jesus, we wanna thank you so much for humbling us through the amazing story, one of so many, but certainly no less amazing than the others we have heard. We thank you for the new life that Nika has in you. And we pray for protection, for purity, for devotion, for uh, just a, a, an immeasurable love for you, Lord Jesus, all the rest of her life. And we thank you for Dr. Leo, for the rest of the young ladies here, the ones who cannot be with us. We pray that you will likewise allow them to grow in their relationship with you so that they can make Christ-committed followers who will make Christ-committed followers as you have challenged us and privileged us to do. And now, Lord, I remember the parents of Nika. I pray, God, that uh, her testimony, the testimony of her siblings, will be such that they will see the humility, the obedience, uh, the submissive heart of Jesus in each of them, so that even without a word, they may be won over to become your children as well, that they may all stand on the same firm foundation who is Jesus, the one who came to save. We give you glory, honor, and thanksgiving. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> Jesus came to save. Glorify him. So let's now talk about this response. Glorify him. We said earlier that it's honoring Jesus, but in a way that is befitting the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, we're told in 2 Corinthians 5, He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. If you are a follower, if we are followers of Jesus, our lives are meant to be lived for Him, not for ourselves. And we just go back to a few examples of what that looks like when we live to glorify Jesus. Again, we go back to Mary, she took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard. She anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. This very expensive perfume would normally be used to anoint the head of a very special, exalted guest. Not the feet. You wash the feet with water. But Mary had such an exalted view of Jesus. She was so humbled in his presence that this thing that probably cost her her life savings, she used it on his feet. And then it says, he, she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, obviously, 
she had to loosen her hair to do that. And in that society, in that time in history, only loose women, if you know what I'm saying, only loose women had loose hair. But she didn't care what people thought because she was going to worship, honor, and glorify Jesus the best way that she could. What is the application to you and to me? The Bible tells us in Romans 12:1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, in other words, because of the mercy we have received from God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You know, when you offer your body to Jesus, you offer everything that comes with it, your thought life, your ambition, your desire, your comfort, your future plans, everything. Because as we said last week, it's either Jesus is Lord of all of who you are, or he is not Lord at all. Just like Nika, she gave her life to serve Jesus. It doesn't mean that we all need to be full-time workers in the ministry, but we need to be full-time followers of Jesus, living every moment to glorify his name. Let's go on. Another example, the example of Lazarus. The chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also. Not only Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus as well. Why? Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Wow. When you think about it, it makes sense. Lazarus was dead and now he's alive. What a testimony. How many of you in this room have Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior? Praise God. You know what? In a spiritual sense, we are no different from Lazarus. Because the Bible says the moment we accepted Christ, we crossed over from death to life. And so that miracle is no less a miracle than Lazarus' own coming back to life. The question is, two questions. Is our new life in Christ helping people to believe in Jesus? Or are we just conforming to the patterns of this world? Another way to ask the question is this. Is our new life in Jesus such a threat to the enemies of Jesus? Here we know that Lazarus was a threat to them. That's why they wanted him killed. Is our new life, our zeal, our devotion towards Jesus a threat to the unseen enemies of our soul? Finally, the example of Andrew and Philip. It says there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him. The Greeks asked Philip, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. What can we learn from this simple example? Number one question. Are there people around you, just like those Greeks were around Philip? Are there people around you? Perhaps they will not tell you, I want to see Jesus. But you know their lives are crying out for a Savior. Are there people around you who do not yet know Jesus? Yes, I'm sure. Two questions. Number one, are we telling Jesus about them? Meaning to say, are we praying to Jesus in their behalf? Are we praying with them side by side so that they can hear our petition for them? Second question is, are we telling them about Jesus? Are we sharing our testimony? Are we sharing the gospel? The example of Andrew and Philip. Our last verses. Jesus said, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. What does that mean? It means when it says love your life, the word there means to, to cherish, to kiss. It's like your life, your priorities, your plans, your pleasure. These are like the most important things to you. You, you, you cannot surrender them to Jesus. But he says if you love your life that way, you will lose it. The word loses. You will destroy it. You will ruin God's plan for your life. But he says, if you hate your life in this world, you will keep it. Meaning to say, if you love Jesus with all of your heart, 
It will be as if you hated what the world has to offer. It's like relinquishing that in favor of living for the glory of Jesus. That's what it means. And then look at the amazing promise. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. And look, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Isn't that amazing? You and I don't deserve to be honored by the Father. But Jesus said, if you serve me, if you live a life to glorify me, my Father will honor you. As we end our time together, I felt led to share with you an old story that maybe some of us know, but I have a feeling many of us in this room may not remember or may not even have a clue about the story of the Ecuador Five. These are five missionary men who were burdened by the Lord in the 1950s to launch a, an evangelistic outreach in 1956, January, to a very remote, very fierce tribe in South America, in Ecuador, called the Aucas. The Aucas were known for their hatred of outsiders, and they had killed many people who tried to make contact and live among them and influence them for whatever reason. But somehow these five men were burdened by the Lord. They were convinced it was their mission in life to share the gospel with the Aucas. And so they tried, of course, very carefully, very strategically, they were able to make friendly contact with them. And it seemed like they were responding well. They would give gifts, you know, drop them from a plane, and then the Aucas would also give gifts to them through a basket. So it, looks like, it looked like things were working out well. So in the first week of January 1956, Nate Saint, this man, he dropped off the other men, Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, Jim Elliott, who was like the leader, of course, Nate Saint, eventually the pilot, Ed McCulley. These five men, they eventually landed and stayed on a small strip of beach uh, or, 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 or ground near the river. They felt that's the only place they could land. And over the next couple of days, they made contact with the Alcas. But it ended in what the world deemed a tragedy. Because when those five men were finally complete, there waiting to make contact, the natives came out, the Aucas came out, and they speared each one of them to death that very moment. And they died on the banks of that river. They said they were going to radio their wives in the afternoon. The radio call never came. So the following day, a search party went out. And true enough, they found the bodies of all five men speared through by the same Aucas they were going to reach out with the gospel. In about two years that followed the murder, the wife of Jim Elliott, the sister of Nate Saint, made contact with the Aucas. And miraculously, they were able to go into the tribe. And from that point onward, many of the Aucas became believers. To the point where, with such great irony, the young son that Nate Saint left behind was baptized by two of the natives who had originally murdered his father. But of course, they eventually became believers. And they baptized Nate Saint's son in the river where they had murdered his father some time back. But the question that remained for some time is this. These five men had guns with them. They had pistols. And the natives kept asking themselves, why did they not shoot us like other people had in the past, perhaps? Why didn't they use their guns when we attacked them? And so the women revealed the agreement the men had. They said to themselves, we will bring guns with us only to protect ourselves from wild animals, but we will never use any gun against these Aucas, no matter what they do, because we have come to bring life, not to take it away. We are not going to be the ones to shoot them and kill them and send them into eternity without Christ. That was their devotion to their God-given mission. And indeed, they served these people with their lives. And in God's way and time, so many of them, because of the sacrifice of these men, became followers of Jesus.
You talk about going all out for Jesus. Jesus came to save, glorify Him. Folks, if you are today a follower of Jesus, my simple question is, does your life bring Him glory? I pray the answer is yes, and that would be wonderful. Let's just keep going and keep giving Him glory in our thoughts, our words, our decisions, our priorities, our actions. But if you're here this afternoon and you have never given your life to Jesus before, I want to tell you, Jesus came to save you. And if I can just go back to the whole idea of the rescue swimmer. If you are drowning and a rescue swimmer is lowered to save your life, the first thing he will want you to do is to relax. Stop struggling. Stop striving. Stop kicking around. Let him do what he came to do for you. Relax. Let him embrace you and let him bring you to safety. Stop struggling with a sin that you're still vacillating. Should I keep on doing this? It feels so good, but I know it's wrong. Or should I surrender my life to Jesus? What if he makes me do this or do that or stop this? Stop struggling. Relax. Fall into his arms. Let him save you. Let's bow our heads. And if you're here this afternoon and that is you, you know it. You know that's who you are. You know Jesus is the one you need. Will you pray this prayer with all humility and just say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm going to stop struggling. I'm going to stop rationalizing. I'm just going to surrender and just give myself to your embrace. Receive you in my heart to be the Savior of my soul and the Lord and the King of my life. From this day forward, Lord Jesus, I belong to you. Do with me as you will. Lead me forward. Make me the person you want me to be. And God, we just want to thank you for this afternoon, the purpose that you had for your word, and we claim that it will not return to you empty. And we pray that all of us, without exception, will live to glorify you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen and Amen. Please come forward for prayer. There will be people who will be blessed to pray for you.
jumpstart your spiritual journey by joining an online or offline small group. Go to ccf.org.ph slash dgroup. Worship together with us via live stream here at 9 a.m., 12 noon, or 3 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. Join us at stream.ccf.org.ph. Want to find a CCF near you? Check us out at ccf.org.ph locations. We are so excited you were able to join us today. God bless and see you next time.